let me start by asking how many of you guys uh, have shot um, HDR photos and stacked those? Most? Anybody who hasn't? Or, or shot star stacking? Raise your hand. some stars. Okay. Well, this is a lot like those two techniques. You're just taking multiple images and taking the best of each of those images and combining it into one. Uh, this is something I got curious about after seeing some really cool uh, insect photography on the internet. And I said, I want to teach myself how to do that. And uh, once I started down that rabbit hole, it started with a macro lens and, and progressed to, to this kind of stuff here. Um, and uh, I was really into it for a period of time. And then I kind of got bored with it. And uh, then a job came along and I got to put this to use. Um, I want to talk about that job real quick. So I'm going to see if I can share a screen and, and share some photos with you guys. Yeah. Uh, right? And while Robert's sharing that screen, just uh, if you guys have any questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. All right. Well, here we go. Here's uh, so the University of Mississippi Museum has over 2,000 and, uh, pieces in their antiquities collection. And they've got ancient, I mean, these are all BC, um, beads the size of a pea up to um, pottery that takes three people to move. They have 900 coins in their collection and they needed all of it photographed to a very, very high um, standard. And so we decided that Focus stacking was the best solution. Uh, we didn't stack everything, but we did most. And uh, for instance, these coins I went into thinking I was just gonna shoot a single frame of each, but we ended up having to stack them because the coins are very primitive. And the difference between the toppest part of the coin, the uppermost portion and the edges of the coin might be a quarter inch because these are so crudely made. And we found that we had to stack them. Um, the reason you don't just stop down a lot is when you get beyond F8, uh, diffraction starts to become an issue. And uh, most lenses are sharpest at their middle apertures. And so you want to stick around there. And so uh, I found that F8 on the, uh, the macro lenses that I've been using, the, the Nikon macros, uh, seems to be the sweet spot. So whenever I stack, that's my go-to aperture. Uh, but on this museum project, we had over 2,000 items. Um, there were two graduate students that were hired um, for a year specifically for this project. The director had been gearing up for this for some time. And our workflow was I would shoot the photos. Uh, you see the laptop tethered there. And the images were saved to the laptop and to an external hard drive. I'd give the hard drive to the graduate students and they would stack all the images and output the stack as a DNG. That would then come back to me and I would color correct everything, edit it and save it as a DNG and JPEG. The JPEG then goes into their online database. Together, we spent 350 hours photographing and shot 218,105 photos in order to create 8,010 final photos. Wow. So here's just, you kind of see the workflow here. Um, I started out with a little acrylic um, thing I was shooting the coins on. There was a little miscommunication and some of the coins were bigger than that. And so I had to uh, come up with a bit, another solution part way through. Um, but this is what it looks like. I used um, Smart Shooter 4 software. Um, it's much better to control your camera with software than to use the built-in program on the camera. Uh, the biggest advantage is if you're shooting a stack and you realize you didn't get enough photos at the end, you can just add more photos onto the end of the project when you're using a laptop. If you're pushing buttons on the back of the camera, you're going to move the camera and you're going to have to do the whole thing over again, start to finish. So you really want to tether if you can. Um, this is my rig. I just have a, uh, a piece of glass there at a 45 degree angle that's reflecting the light down onto the coin. And this is called axial photography because the light is coming from the same axis as the lens. Uh, and so that works out really nicely for coins. And there, here are some of the completed stacks. And you can see these things are very small. And so these were, I think I was shooting, I want to say 
12 to 15 shots on these at very, very fine increments between the shots. And uh, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of detail on these things. Um, that's why we go through all this effort. Um, so let's see here, I got a few more. Whoop. A few more of the coins. We also did glass shards. Uh, it's amazing. This stuff dates back BC, and uh, the uh, the detail and the intricacy of these was really amazing. Uh, here we are, getting ready to shoot some pottery. Um, they purchased this light table. We got some lights. This is a piece of packing foam that we built a tent out of to put over the pieces. Um, so we would. This is how we would shoot an item. We would get it in the tent, put the little styrofoam dome over it, and every shot was shot with a color checker and a, a little scale. And then we would move the piece and it might take 15 or 20 different views to get inside the bowl, the bottom of the bowl, inside the lid, the bottom of the lid. It's very meticulous. And the reason we did the stacking is so you can get very fine detail on any part of the image from the front to the back everywhere. Um, in reviewing these images, they were finding information, finding where there were uh, cracks in the bowls where repairs have been made. They were finding things they hadn't documented before. So these, these photos were giving them a look at these things they hadn't had before. So Robert, just a quick question. When you're shooting these uh, pottery and stuff, I'm assuming there's more images you're stacking or is it still just about the same amount of images? Um, it varies depending on the depth of the piece. A piece like this that's uh, maybe about six inches tall because the camera distance is back a little bit, uh, I can shoot a little bit wider um, distance between the focusing points and you might knock out something like this in, in 15 shots, whereas um, a bowl that's eight inches across might take 80 or 100 shots. Yeah, wow. Uh, the higher magnification you have, the, the closer you are to the subject, the finer your increments need to be and the more photos you need. Uh, I'm going to kind of scoot through these. Uh, some of these pieces were so reflective that we had to build an elaborate tent to deal with them. Uh, this is a bead. You can see the size of the bead. Um, here's the bead and here's an imprint of what the bead looks like. Um, these are put on display. And so you can see some of these items are very small. This shot may have taken 20 shots. Um, it was really a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Here's some more beads. These things are pea size. These we did in single shot. Uh, and these are shot at F32. And you can see how little depth their field of depth of field there is at F32. Um, When we got into these larger, very reflective pieces, our little tent just really wasn't working, so we had to scale things up. Uh, we got a 10 foot by 20 foot party tent, and we went to Home Depot and bought some visqueen and grommets, and we built an enormous light tent. And we had, uh, you see, I've got four lights there. I had a, um, a visqueen ceiling and so we had light coming through the ceiling and then we had light coming from both sides with those other lights and I had a little shooting area where you would not see the laptop and me and everything else reflected in the piece photographing these things is like photographing a black bowling ball and so this is what we're getting and so like I say this was a, a major project and they looked at the photos that uh, the Met Museum has online, and that's what they said as a target for their quality standard. So anyhow, that's really about it there. I don't think there's much more to show you there. Um, so there is a place for focus, stack, focus stacking in your workflow. You will find uh, technical photography in other places where um, it's going to come in really handy. Uh, it also can be used for landscapes. Now, in landscapes, you need much, uh, many fewer shots. Um, this is, and I'll see if I can bring these up side by side here. Okay, on the left, I've got a shot. Um, 
Let's see if I can get my menu here, excuse me. Okay, the photo on the left, this is three shots at F8, focused on the fence, focused in the middle ground, focused on the barn. This is one shot at F22, focused in the middle. Um, I don't know if this is coming through on your monitor. Can you see that the one on the left is sharper? Yes, yeah, we can see that. Oh yeah, okay. big time. That's diffraction. That's why you don't simply stop down a lot. Your lens becomes less sharp once you move past that middle aperture. Um, the only time I shoot stop down when I want depth of field is as a backup in case the stack doesn't stack up properly. And I always recommend shooting a backup shot because sometimes image stacking, it's just like HDR. You put the photos in the program and it spits out something beautiful and sometimes you get a Picasso. So always shoot a backup shot, but you can see you know, the loss of detail throughout the image at F32. Yeah. So this is why we go through the trouble of focus stacking. Um, and I've got a couple other examples here. Um, Man-made objects tend to stack very well. There's not a lot going on in that image that pretty much that's how it came out of the stacking software. I think this was about 20 images. Um, when you get to insects and things with fine detail, uh, it takes a lot more photos. This is 105 photos stacked. And where you have parts that overlap other parts, the stacking software can get a little confused and you get some artifacts and some, some things just kind of glitch on you. And in the stacking software, uh, I use Helicon Focus. The other major softwares that people use are, let's see here, no second, that was my notes. Uh, Photoshop can be used. On One Photo Raw can be used. Helicon Focus, which is what I like, and Zarine Stacker. I think all of these, I know Helicon does, has the provision when something glitches, you can go in and find the original image where that part looks good and clone from that original image onto your stacked image to correct it. It's a little tedious. Um, if you're doing insects, you get to spend a lot of quality time with your mouse. But this is 105 shots. Wow. Um, the other way to stack images, instead of shifting the distance your lens is focused at, you shift the distance from the camera to the subject. This is actually superior, especially for macro work. It doesn't work for landscapes, obviously. Uh, the reason it's superior is it's all lenses to some, uh, uh, some about of breathing in it. As you shift the focus, the magnification changes. And when you shift the camera, you get rid of that problem. You have the camera or the lens focused at a fixed distance. You adjust the camera distance to where that focus point is in front of your subject and you shoot until you've moved the focus point past the subject, but you don't change the focus point, you change the camera position. Uh, this is what we use for extreme close-ups. Um, there's a phonograph needle. This was 78 shots and I use a focusing rail and this was done by hand, manually creeping that focusing rail forward a little bit between each shot. It's very tedious. There are automated rails that will automate this for you, make it a lot better. Um, I've got a little video I'd like to go ahead and share with you where I start to finish create a stack. I may not show all the way through the end. I may cut this off and jump back in. Uh, before I do that though, uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, that's, I got a couple of questions just want to get caught up on. Um, Michael was asking, uh, can this setup and software be used to create an interactive 360? Um, I, I don't know much. Okay, sorry, the Pottery Bowl made me think you had to choose a front to the stack and back. But yeah, I, I imagine there's some similar things you're going to be doing. I, but if anybody has an answer to that, throw it in the chat. Uh, well, uh, one thing I will mention, uh, Helicon Focus and Zarine Stacker and I've never played with this, but one of the options they offer is to create a synthetic 3D view. 
-hmm. So you can take a stack and tell it to do that and it will create a left image and a right image that can be viewed in 3D. I haven't gone down that rabbit hole, but so maybe that's kind of what the question was. Yeah, that's a, that's a good something we could look at. Also, Doug asked, he, he missed the first couple of minutes, wanted you to talk a little bit more about the software. He said, Helicon Focus. Can you tell us a little bit more about how much it costs, if there's any other options that might be good? Okay, there, there are, well, if you've got Photoshop, Photoshop can do stacking. It's an add-on. And so Photoshop does a lot of things, and this is a the thing they've kind of tacked on. Uh, I tried it. It works-ish. Um, but I think the dedicated software does a better job. There are actually free stacking programs out there, but again, you get what you pay for. Both the Helicon and the Zarine offer free trials. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a long time since I've looked at those free trials. I don't remember, do they watermark images? Do they give you a certain number, maybe you know, 10 shots, or do they work for 30 days? I do not remember the limitations, uh, but I would urge anybody that wants to play with this, download those two and play around with them. Uh, each has their advantages and disadvantages. The things that appealed to me on Helicon Focus, it will take camera raw files, whereas Zareen wants uh, DNG files or TIFF files. So you've got to convert your camera files over to DNG or TIFF if you want to use Zareen. And in the, in the video you're using Helicon? Yes. Okay, great. So we'll see, uh, well, we'll see I, it in action. Yeah, well, you'll get to see it in action. and I. Um, the uh, Helicon also tends to be pretty quick, um, especially if you use JPEGs like I did in the demo. Um, and I want to, uh, while I've got it up on my screen, I want to show a couple more images and when, zebra, when stacking goes wrong, oh, great. things to watch out for. So um, just like shooting HDR images, you see these trees here? Yeah. You know, if it's a windy day and these are shot handheld, which is always a little sketchy, if it's a windy day, your stacks are probably going to be disappointing. This is why you shoot one at F22 or F32. This is why you shoot a backup. Yeah. Um, here's another one that uh, the stack, there's some alignment issues over here. It's, you can see this little fence post here is doubled. You know, we've got some weird things going on here. There's the F32 shot. It's softer overall, but at least we don't have any stacking errors. Uh, and here's one. I shot three shots on this, feeling like it would screw up, and it did. We've got a zone of focus here on the sign, and then this tree is out. And then we got a zone of focus in the middle that's sharp, and then this tree is out of focus. And then we've got the building sharp. And on top of all of that, we've got some tree movement. So stacking is awesome when it works, but it will bite you in the butt sometimes. So don't go to an assignment and shoot stacks and think I got this covered. Always shoot a backup photo. Awesome. Well, let's let's take a look at the video. I think it'll answer some people's questions. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna film a little video here on focus stacking and I'll take these images into the computer and run through the focus stacking software. So uh, first thing we're gonna do is I need to focus my camera in the front of the subject. So I've got that done. Now I'm going to go to menu and I'm going to select focus shift shooting. That's on. I'm going to walk you through these different settings. Now the number of shots we're going to shoot 50 photos. The next setting is the focus step width. This is how far the focus is shifted between each shot. On this camera we've got a scale of 1 to 10 and we're going to go with a pretty small increment of 3. Okay, we've got interval between shots. We've got set to 0 seconds. If you're shooting a subject with a strobe, you'll need to figure out how long the strobe needs to recycle between shots and add that time in between the shots so the camera doesn't shoot before the strobe is ready. Uh, since we're using uh, LED lights here, that's not an issue. Uh, it also helps to put an interval in between shots if your camera might shake a little bit in between pictures. Uh, first frame exposure lock, uh, that 
make sure that all the exposures are exactly the same based on the first frame. Uh, since we're in manual exposure mode, that really doesn't affect us any. So we actually don't need that on. We can go ahead and turn that off. Okay, uh, silent photography is on. This way we're not using the mechanical shutter inside the camera, only the electronic shutter. So we'll have no vibration of any kind. So let's go on up here. We're going to press start. And there'll be a little delay that gives the camera time to kind of settle down. And uh, we're shooting photos. And with 50 photos to take, this is going to take a little bit. So uh, I'll speed this up in post so you don't have to sit here and watch the camera. Okay. Camera is finished shooting. And I can confirm that the focus is well beyond the camera. It looks like the back edge of my table is in focus. And so I know I've captured all of the camera since I started in front and I saw it finish. Mm -hmm. Behind, I know I have everything I need to make a successful stack. So let's bring these images into the computer. Okay, we've got the JPEGs imported here into Photo Mechanic. Let's take a look here and zoom out. All right, clearly we're focused in front of the camera on the first image. I'm going to start going through these now. And I can see the leading edge of the camera. Right here, it's starting to come into focus. I'm going to back up a couple and I'm going to tag that one right there. And now we're going to go forward through these. You can see the front portions of the camera are nice and sharp. We're going to keep going as we work our way all the way to the back portion. And by now, we're about uh, 30 shots in. And uh, all of the camera is sharp, but this little bit of background that's in focus here, I want to take that back just a little bit more. That looks good to me. That's at frame 37, so I'm going to tag that one. So we're going to use frames, uh, let's see, what is this one? This is what about frame nine through thirty seven is all we're really going to need. And uh, one advantage of doing a focus stack is I can choose exactly where I want my depth of field to end. Whereas if I shot a photo with the minimum aperture the lens is capable of, I have to live with whatever depth of field that renders. And I actually did shoot a photo that way at f36, and we'll compare that to the stacked image later. But right now, I'm going to select the ones that have the range in focus that I want to see in focus. And we're going to drag those off into Helicon Focus and see what we get. And we're working with JPEG, so this should go pretty quick. Okay, we've got our 30 JPEGs in here. You see them lined up over here on this side. And we're going to use method B. I seem to have the best luck with that method, but there are other methods you can use if you're not happy with the results you get. Now, uh, one thing I've done is on all the work I did for the museum, I archived every single raw camera image. And because the stacks that we made are very good, but they're not perfect. And I know better software will exist down the road. And so I've got four or five hard drives in the safe deposit box uh, from all the photos we shot of the museum artifacts. So that someday, if we want to come back and restack those, we can. All right, so everything is in here that we need. I'm now going to go over here to file. And that looks good. All right, we're going to go ahead and render this. And as we render it, it's going to look at each image and identify the parts of each photo that are sharp. And it's going to start building a map here. 
And we're going to watch this gradient here. This is a good place to watch. And you see how this is coming in nice and smooth. If we saw bands in between the frames here, that would be an indication that our stacks were too far apart, but I don't see any banding. And that looks pretty spectacular. Uh, I don't know if you can see it and what you're looking at, but I can see a slight hazy area right along this edge between the camera and the background. And that's just normal. That's the stacking software doing the best it can. Uh, if I carry the stack all the way back here to the back edge, it would eliminate this little halo, but I don't want that much depth of field in the image. So I'm just not going to do that. I'll retouch this little halo here and around here. One thing I noticed um, is in some of these different images, you see a little bit of a prismatic effect here. And it's apparent in the photos that are out of focus, but the shots where this part of the camera was sharp did not have that effect. And I wondered how the software would render that, but it did an excellent job. Sometimes iridescent areas like on insects can cause a little bit of a problem when stacking, uh, but this did a real nice job. And so, you know, check your boundaries, like I said, along the edge here and anywhere one part of the item overlaps another part. If that all looks clean, then you're probably done. Um, you could do retouching in the software and select the image. Let's say you want to retouch this little area here. You can find the image where that's sharp and paint that in and then find the image where this is sharp and paint that in and so forth and so on. Uh, but it's a little tedious. And uh, this is a pretty simple area to clone in, and I think it's going to be much faster in Photoshop. So I'm going to just blow right past the retouching in the telecon focus and just output this image. So we're going to go up here to file. Let me say save. And it's going to put it back in the source folder, and here's the name it's going to give it. Uh, I'm going to change this a little bit just to keep me clear on things. There we go. And we're going to save that in high quality. Okay. Takes only a moment to save. Let's go back to Photo Mechanic now. Okay. On the left is a photo I shot at F36, just a single image. And on the right is the stack we just completed that we shot at F8. And I want to show you some differences. Let me zoom in a bit. Okay, I think we can clearly see, at least I can see it on my screen. I hope this comes through on the video. There is a definite difference. Okay, on the left here is a photo I shot at F36, the minimum aperture. Silver details here, you see how this is blown out and there's a glow around that. Whereas here, I have much finer detail. The same thing is true down here, where it says Rolleiflex. Around every one of these highlights, there's a haze, and that's what diffraction does. So let's move on down a little further. Oh, here's another thing I want to point out. I don't know if you can see any of this on your screen or not. I can read the serial number of the camera quite clearly here. It's completely illeg illegible. <clears throat> I can read the serial number of the camera quite clearly <laughs> on the stack image. The F36 image, I can't even tell there's any writing there. We go on down a little bit more. Let's look at this optics. Okay. Now, on. Okay. Well, I go on and on there and prattle on for a bit. Uh, video is too long, but you get oh. the idea. That's great. I love it.
Wow. I, uh, I've never seen it actually in action. So that's really cool. I did go in and look at the website for Hel Helicon. Um, you do, they do have a 30 day trial and there are three different licenses you can get, uh, light pro and then premium. I think pro has the remote with it. Uh, so you can do oh. remote control of the camera. A uh, one-year license is anywhere from thirty to sixty-five dollars. The lifetime is up, you know, one hundred fifteen to two forty. So it's really reasonable. Uh, but for a thirty-day trial, that's pretty generous these days. So definitely something to go check out. Yeah, I went ahead and ponied up for the lifetime license um, because of the amount of work that we we're going to be doing, as did the museum. And uh, like I said, I, I this worked out great because I got to do the photography and I had grad students do the stacking, which can be a little tedious. Uh, and they also did the retouching. And they did a very fine mm -hmm. job. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention that Helicon Focus will do, and I don't know about the others, it will do automated batch stacks. So we found that we could put, say, 700 photos in a folder, uh, maybe you know, 14 different objects, 50 shots each, and turn Helicon Focus loose on it. And the software looks at the photos and says, well, here's 50 pictures that were shot a half second apart. And then there was a five minute break and then it started another sequence. And so it knows those 50 pictures are one image. Then that break is moving to the next image. So you can throw a tremendous number of photos at it. And this is what we were doing. It's they would throw hundreds and hundreds of photos in there, uh, click go, go home for the evening, come back the next day, and see what came out. And there'd be some glitches in there, but a lot of it was done. And so they didn't have to sit there and watch it crank through all these images. Yeah, that's cool. I, I, I really appreciate you showing the difference between F32 and, and stacked. I don't think people realize how many flaws are in the lens that, that really do show up when you try and push it like that. Uh, but I think many people are all oh, just, you know, as much depth of field as possible. That's not the best answer always. And you can see that difference there. And I think in the video, it actually did come through really well where you could see the differences. Okay. I, like I say, it looked good on my screen. I did not know what compression and everything else would do to it. So I'm, I'm glad that y'all could see it. Um, I guess another question would be, uh, what camera are you using? What are your favorite lenses for shooting, you know, a lot of this stacked stuff? Okay. Uh, well, the... Stacks that I did at the museum, I started, we did the first couple of sort of test shots. I was on the Z6 at that point. And uh, once I knew we were gonna move forward with that project, I bought a Z7 uh, for the higher resolution. And about midway through the Z7 II came out and I, I upgraded to that. So I was using the, the best resolution I could. Um, I really liked the mirrorless experience and the, the silent shutter. Um, some of the earlier stacks, the B and the phonograph needle, those were shot with a D850. Um, I had the Nikon 55 and 105 F mount lenses, and I hesitated to buy the new Z uh, macro lenses, but I went ahead and bought them. And it's been my experience that every time I've sold an F mount lens and purchased the new Z equivalent. They're sharper than the F mount lenses they replaced. Mm -hmm. I find that to be true on every single one. And I didn't think you could do any better than the old F mount 105 macro. And I've been proven wrong. The, the Z 105 is phenomenal. Um, for the really, really close up stuff, um, I use. Uh, extension tubes and you know i don't know why nikon quit making extension tubes but they did back in the day they they used to make extension tubes and they never made an autofocus extension tube so you know with the f mount i was using these kinco brand you know plastic things uh and they work uh i used these and a f mount 105 to shoot the uh the b uh i've since purchased some Z mount uh, macro tubes. These are off of Amazon. Again, I really wish Nikon would make one. Um, and the, uh, the 105 macro, or this is the 50 millimeter Z macro and I've got the 105 uh, here. And I, they're wonderful lenses. These get you to one to one. And with the extension tubes, you might get two to one-ish, 
Uh, to get beyond that, you have to get into some, some different lenses. Uh, there's a lot of lenses out there that'll get you to two to one. Um, I discovered through reading forums and what have you, the old Nikon 50 millimeter and larger lens, the 2.8 and larger lens actually makes an awesome macro lens reversed. And that's what this is. Um, that's how I shot that needle on the phonograph. That gets you, I've got a, uh, a Nikon PB6 bellows. That's the last bellows Nikon made. Uh, the FTC adapter, which you need on here for the grip on the Z9 to clear the bellows. Otherwise, it's hard to mount. If you have a camera with a grip on the bottom, you either need that uh, F to Z adapter or you have to put a small extension tube back here just to mount the camera on the bellows. Uh, this is a helical focusing mount here. This um, comes in handy. It's like a variable extension tube. I can vary that from 37 to about 80 millimeter. And so that helps to focus rather than using the focusing on the rail. And I can adjust my magnification here. Uh, here's my 50 millimeter and larger lens reversed. And then here's a little lens hood on here. And between here and here, there's about a dozen adapters that I had to pick up off AliExpress or Amazon or eBay or wherever I could find them to go from F mount to 42 millimeter thread mount from 42 to 32 to 20 to, you know, there's a lot of adapters in between. You just cobble together something and, and see if it works. Um, cool. The great thing is uh, the bellows I bought off of uh, Amazon, I'm sorry, off eBay, the lens already had, I've probably got $250 in that whole rig. So it's pretty cheap and gets you up pretty close. It's a lot of fun to play with. I, I really encourage you to, to do it. And you can also reverse lenses and get some nice uh, macro effects that way. Uh, Noblex, I think it's Noblex, makes a, um, a bellows that has an autofocus adapter for the, they make it for several cameras, but they have it for the Z where you can actually have your 50 or 105 macro lens on the front of the bellows and retain autofocus capability. But it's a $1,200 bellows, so I hadn't gotten around to it. Wow, great. Well, we, have, we have a few questions I'm going to throw at you. Uh, first of all, David was asking if one of your renders goes for so bad. Um, can you run it again to get a better result? Or are you saying you can go in and like fix specific areas or specific images? What, what do you do to fix it when it, it goes bad? Well, it's a, it, that's a judgment call. Uh, I shot a photo I thought would be really cool. Um, I had the camera on a tripod and I used a macro lens and I, I got in really close on the stamen on a white azalea. These are white stamens against a white azalea and it, the whole thing, I sprayed it, misted it with water. It was really cool looking. Shot about an 80 photo stack and Helicon Focus looked at all that white on white with all these little groove do uh, uh, dew drops on it. And it just borked. Uh, I look, took one look at that and realized I don't want to spend the next 12 hours retouching this image and just deleted it. Yeah. Um, sometimes that happens. Sometimes like on that B uh, where the antenna would overlap another portion. You know, if you think about it, in one image, you've got a sharp antenna. In another image, you've got that antenna out of focus and it's a blob and all the stacking software does this. It can get confused and pick the wrong image for that section to, to use. And that's when you go in and you select the image where the, where the problem is, you, find, you roll down the images, do you find the one where that's sharp and you clone there. And then you do that bit by bit. Um, there's, if you're gonna stack, there's, there's no time except for perhaps landscapes when you're gonna shoot, put it in the software and you're done. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna have to retouch. It's just and that and that cloning and stuff that's in Helicon or do you go into somewhere else and do that? All right. If you want to work layer by layer, you need to do it in Helicon or in whatever your stacking software is. Cause once you flatten that and save that as an image, you no longer have access to those individual layers. It doesn't kick so, out a, a layered PSD with the Photoshop or anything. Um, that's a good question. I haven't done it. I've yeah. just rendered the image and, and exported it. Yeah. Um, in, in the case of that camera, um, 
I got a photo here. Let's see if I can. Yeah, let me bring up. Um, you do the. Yeah, go ahead and share your screen again. Yeah, I, I covered that up. Can you do that for me? Let's see. Let's see. I think I think you need to. Oh, do I've got it. it. I've got. It. I yeah. found it. I found it. There you go. I'm still a little slow at this. You're fine. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm an overtired guy. I don't zoom anymore. Uh, so here is. Now let me uh, move this over so I can lock these and zoom in a bit. Yeah, maybe not that much. All right. Remember, I told you there was some little bit of errors here. You see this halo? Yeah. Right there. And so this is retouched. I, I looked at that and I said, you know what? I don't want to play with, around with, you know, find this layer, find this layer, find this layer, you know, do it that way. I said, I can do that faster in Photoshop. So I just spat this out in Photoshop and just clean that up. But you see how you've got a gradation here. It starts about here and it gets lighter and lighter and lighter until it gets to here. Yeah. That's just the nature of stacking. Uh, I don't know a way around that. So you will, there will be some retouching. Um, so again, on the left is how it came out of Helicon Focus and on the right is retouched. There's another area here that did not do wonderful. You see this right here? Yeah. The edge of the camera went fuzzy. And this seems to be more of an issue. If this line meets another line at a 90 degree angle, it seems to work out fine, but when you have a subtle change in the angles, it tends to mess up more. So yeah. that was another area I had to clean up a little bit. And again, this was a choice. I said, I can do this faster in, in uh, Photoshop than in Helicon Focus. And you see it did it again here. So um, retouching is, is gonna be part of your life when you stack. Yeah. Um, if you shoot fine enough increments and there, your subject doesn't move and your camera doesn't move, There'll be a minimal amount of it. Good. Uh, Donovan had asked, uh, somebody had asked, does Canon do this? It looks like Donovan Kelly shared that the R5 is a setting called focus bracketing, which I believe is similar. Mm -hmm. I've, I haven't done focus stacking. That's why I wanted to do this. I think it's great for us <laughs> to learn about it. So that's something to look at. Um, and then if anybody does on Sony, does Sony also have a similar mode? If anybody of the Sony shooters want to chime in there. Um, and then Clay asked, you know, is there a way, way to do it without having the newest camera? And, and I believe you mentioned that you can do it with a rail. You could just do manually right. do it on a focus rail. You used to do that, right? Well, that's how I did that um, in the uh, uh, photo of the needle. When you get, uh, I better get this off of here without dropping it. <laughs> well, don't go it. Excuse me. You're fine. The whole point is for it to hold on to the camera. Yep. Well, so you've got a knob here, I loosen the lock, where you would move this and this shifts your camera forward and backward. And so you've got it set and you shoot a photo and I turn it a quarter turn, shoot another photo, turn it a quarter turn, shoot and do that, you know, 78 times. For that little needle shot. They do have automated focusing rails mm -hmm. where you've got a cable hooked up to it and either with a remote control box where you program in how many shots and what the distance between them is going to be, or some of these automated focusing rails can interface with focus shooting or focus stacking software. Helicon Focus supports several electronic focusing rails. So you go into your Helicon it's actually, it's a sub program. I think it's called Helicon Capture or, or something else. You, it comes with the pro version of Helicon Focus. So you go in there on your computer and tell it, you know, I want 60 shots, um, you know, a quarter millimeter apart. And then the focusing rail moves your camera for you. Uh, if you do high magnification above one to one or above one to two, uh, that's really the way to go. And then can you mention the, the, the brand of the focusing rail that you like? Is it that one you have right there? Uh, no, this is actually, uh, this is the old Nikon Bellows. Okay. I, I have a, 
a Chinese four-way focusing rail that I've used. It, you know, I got off AliExpress. Um, I'm looking at getting one, and I don't recall the photo or the brand name. I want to say it's called We Macro or We something like that. I, I, they sell one uh, that's in the two to three hundred dollar range. Yeah. That's supported by a lot of software, and so they are out there. I've, I've kind of toyed with the idea, but I haven't pulled the trigger yet. And there are really there are so many rail options right now. Um, like I say, yeah. a lot of the Chinese companies that are making them, and then even older ones on eBay. You know, because rails have been around forever. Yeah. Um, and a lot of you know the older ones are they're they're out there. So definitely something you can go look at. Uh, um, I wish I'd written down the brand name. There's one uh, slider for shooting video that can also fo function as a macro rail. And I don't remember what brand it is, but you know it's not hard to. To do it, they just did a little extra programming on it, and so you know, if you do video and still, you can get a two for one. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't recall the manufacturer. And then there was another question about a, a shooting raw. Uh, do you have you shot in raw much, and and is there an advantage, or is it just slow things down too much? What do you think about uh, that? I always, always, always shoot raw. Uh, Fred Sisson uh, barked at me at the first uh, Utah symposium I went to. And he said, are you shooting raw? I said, no. And he chewed me out pretty good and says, uh, you need to be shooting raw. And uh, I did it because he told me to. And at first I didn't get the benefit. But once you start editing the photos, uh, you know, all on JPEG, all of your choices are baked into the image and you can uh, manipulate the image, but you can't undo those choices. Mm -hmm. And the more you manipulate the image, the more your quality suffers. Uh, raw, you also have the advantage of, depending on your camera, perhaps a 12 or 14 bit uh, capture instead of an 8 bit color space. And so um, I always shoot in raw, I stack raw. I don't go to JPEG till I'm done. When I've got the image the way I like it, I've sharpened it, I've done everything to it. Convert to JPEG is the last step. And so, and then it does slow down a bit when you're working in Helicon, but that the result is worth it in your opinion. I feel like it is. And then we're, we're not sure of the question about if, if it can export a layered document. That's something we'd have to look at. Somebody have to look at Helicon because neither one of us know that. Um, let's see. Jeff had asked, is there a way to do an outdoor stacked image that still has a sun flare, sunburst flare in it? You know, uh, or would that just something you shoot at F32 and add it in? I think that's After what you'd... I think that's exactly what you'd do is you'd uh, you shoot a stack and then shoot your safety shot at F32, which will also get you your flare, and then complete your stack. And I'd say open your your completed stack and your your flare shot in Photoshop. Your stack is going to be sharp throughout, but your sun's going to be just sort of an area. And so uh, then you take that that star from your your other shot and clone that in. And when you're shooting these stacks, you're pretty much shooting aperture wide open on almost everything, or no, or... no, no. Uh, F8 is my, my sorry, pet... uh, sorry, F8. That, that was right. F, that's that. my pet aperture. Uh, I've sort of discovered. Uh, I haven't done really extensive testing. I did some casual testing, and uh, there's a rule of thumb that most lenses are sharpest at their middle aperture, and, and I think that holds true. And people, you can always go and test your lens to see exactly. which is the sharpest and then use that one for that. Because some lenses are going to be different, but yeah, F8, F9, you know, somewhere in there is usually where you're going to want to be. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm just checking. I don't think we have any other questions. I think you answered a lot of questions. I think I really appreciate this because, because again, just seeing it done makes it like more accessible automatically. I'm like, oh, that's how you do it. Uh, I think people's eyes lit up when they saw, oh, you just, there's a software that helps. Most people probably weren't aware of that software. So this is a really informative and great. Uh, if there's any other questions, go ahead and throw them in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for any last questions, just want to remind people that uh, we do have the symposium coming up and registration is now open. Uh, I believe until May 1st, uh, it's, a, it's a early bird pricing. So go ahead and check that out on the UPAA website, upaa.org. But other than that, awesome, Robert. Thank you so much for your time. And